Uh, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 394th new social environment. I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today uh, for a conversation between Ron Nagel and Dan Cameron. We're thrilled to also have our publisher and artistic director, Fong Bui, here, who will read from Anselm Berrigan's Pregrets to close today's program. We open all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are, we are on the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenin of Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Artist Ron Nagel was born in San Francisco where he currently lives and works. His first one person exhibition took place in 1968. And since then he has had exhibitions at numerous museums including the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, the San Diego Museum of Art, the Museum Boijmans van Buningen in Rotterdam, the Secession in Vienna, the Friedrich Neum in Kassel, and the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Nagel is known for his intimately scaled sculptures made of ceramic elements that are slipcast, fired, and embellished with an epoxy and other synthetic materials that allow him to expand his forms beyond the limits of clay. Some are glazed to a hot red finish, others textured like stucco and then airbrushed. And New York-based curator, art writer, and educator Dan Cameron began his career with the 1982 New Museum of Contemporary Art Exhibition, Extended Sensibilities, Homosexual Presence in Contemporary Art, the first museum effort in the US to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. During his 11 years as senior curator at the New Museum, Cameron has organized survey exhibitions of David Wojnarowicz, Martin Wong, Marcel Odenbach, among many others. He is founding director of Prospect New Orleans, which assists in the cultural rebuilding of the city after Hurricane Katrina. In 2016, he or organized the exhibition when Jackie met Ethel on Jackie Curtis and Ethel Eichelberger at Howell Happening in New York. He is an editor at large at The Rail. So without further ado, please take it away. Thank you so much, Anya. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank Welcome you. to... Um, uh, to the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, I'm Dan Cameron. Uh, Ron is just on the other side. Hi, Ron. Hi. Um, so I have, I'm, first of all, I'm so thrilled to be able to do this, um, Ron. I followed your work from afar um, for many decades. Uh, you know, it was wow. a little hard to see your work. And so you'd have to kind of make extra effort. And now that you've had the last you know, several shows with Matthew Marks, it's been so much easier on New Yorkers, you know, to be able to see your work. But uh, having said that, and feeling like I already knew something about you, I, I started going through the book Nagel, Ron, uh, this past uh, weekend, and I realized there was a whole side of you that I didn't really know that much about, which is that since your earliest days, you have been I guess the word would be simultaneously, um, someone who is very accomplished in the field of music and who's also very accomplished in the field of visual arts. But maybe it's safe to say, unlike other artists who make music where the two projects seem sort of interlinked, um, for you, it's almost that they've had these uh, parallel existences. It wasn't until I think it was maybe Dave Hickey writing about your work said, you know, that that both your sculptures and your songs are, you know, small, modest, I think was maybe the word he used, um, mm -hmm. but also uh, perfect. And, and so before we get into the visuals, I was wondering if you could just, you know, shed some light about your own development and how, I mean, was, for example, was there a point where you ever thought the music and the art might intersect or, or maybe did they, but, and, and, and was there ever a point where you thought maybe you'd be a musician instead of being a visual artist or, or vice versa? I mean, um, that's too many questions, but. Um, I, you know, I, can take, 
I can take it from that point and then we could add more. <clears throat> as, time, as time has gone by, I feel, feel that the relationship in terms of uh, sort of a specific format uh, for one thing, thinking intuitively, trusting my instincts. Um, I seem to be drawn to uh, a certain way of working and, and why most of my stuff has, has a little bit of a dark edge to it, I would say, or melancholy perhaps. Uh, I can't say specifically that there's, it's really more about feeling. When I mean, what I learned over the years of doing music, particularly if you work, I'm working with other people and I have a partner, Scott Matthews, who I've been writing with for years. And we he did a mystery record. trend with you, wasn't the it? Mystery trend was the first band to play the Fillmore Auditorium. And Scott joined Mystery Trend, so you guys have been working together. No, Scott wasn't oh. in Mystery Trend. Scott uh, was, uh, he, we formed the Do Rocks in around 1979, something like that, and released, released uh, a, an album. And then it was uh, re-released uh, a few years ago again as a, I dare, cult classic. Everything I do is a cult class. <laughs> I did write one song in the 70s by the Tubes called Don't Touch Me There, which actually was a hit. It and sure was. I saw the Tubes do it, perform it. Oh, and good for you, man. The Peppermint Lounge or Danceteria. <laughs> yeah, of, that, yeah, yeah. well, we were very close with them. And a friend of mine uh, co-wrote it with me, Jane Dornacker, and... Um, that's the one that I still see, although it's not what I expect, still get royalties from it to this day. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, somewhere along the line, Barbara Streisand did a couple of songs, but there were others who might fall into the category of what we call yacht rock, which would be like Pablo Cruz or early uh, Sammy Hagar or we, we pretty much covered the, the gamut. Um, I would say in terms of actually feeling, what shall I say, trans, uh, having a feeling of tr being trans, tr what happens if you're, you're transported or transcendent would be when I first started listening to a black radio stations in, came across gospel music. And this was in the 50s, early 50s, maybe. Uh, and from there, that made a transition into doo-wop. And I was hooked. I was just completely taken to a whole other level because up to that point, white music was pretty vanilla, either that or taken, co-opted from, from rhythm and blues or, or doo-wop. So you have your Pat Boone and consequently, I'm not a big Elvis Presley fan. I don't, I'm not interested in, in hearing his version of Hound Dog. I mean, because I heard the real one. You've and heard Big that, Mama Thornton sing it. What's it? You've heard Big Mama Thornton sing I it. I heard that record and that was produced by Lieber and Stoller. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Lieber, I had a, that was it. Let's see. But a stole it later with, became a significant art collector, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, and so well, he was married to Barbara Rose at one point, one of them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I met him. So like big, big deals for me would be like to be able to shake hands with one of those guys. Uh, very bright, very street at the same time. So that kind of brought me into this area of high low, you know, like this is really smart music that has characteristics that I try to have in my work, uh, both music and uh, which would be appeal, basically emotional appeal without, mm -hmm. without being superficial or whatever. Now to answer one of your other questions, there's always been this conflict well, if you like that, 
if you like that kind of music, like doo up, then how could you possibly like John Coltrane? Or how can you like WC? I, music is music, but I still go for the, am I being trivialized, particularly with the new trend of ceramics going nuts? Like, well, what, what I have, my background originally started with seeing Peter Volkus and Ken Price and a guy named Michael Fremke. So those were, the, to me, the three kind of major figures for me. And to this day, they still are. That and Japanese ceramics. But Volkos personally brought you into ceramics. Would that be, is that an uh, overstatement? I, at first, he kind of he started off when I heard a rumor about this guy who was an excellent craftsman and could do stuff with ceramics that nobody else had done and still take it out of this sort of symmetry or it's got to be round, you know, stuff that could only be done on the wheel and reconstruct, he'd throw, throw pieces and then reconstruct them. I guess it would be, it wasn't called that at the time. And he would just improvise in the same spirit as abstract expressionist painting, really. If um, So, he, I didn't get into graduate school and I always claim it's because I had shitty slides. So all you kids out there, make sure your slides are good. <laughs> and he said, you don't want to, what? I'm sorry. All you kids listening out there who still <laughs> have slides. Yeah. I think now it's just make sure your TikTok's in order. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different world, you know, which I try to keep up with and now I'm finally kind of trying to combine, literally combine on a maybe TikTok or a little bigger level, the music and, and the art. Uh, oh, really? Well, I'm working with a singer who I'm just nuts about, female, who sings along the lines of uh, Julie London or Dusty Springfield, oh, wow. um, a softer approach but very sensual and no, no melisma, you know, no bending of notes or bullshit like that. And she started, so I paid her to do demos and I was like, oh my God, you know, I started crying. I mean, it was, I was blown away. I mean, I said, that's what's missing here. You know, I mean, I could sing to a small degree. I have a very limited range and tell people I was born without a falsetto. <laughs> she informed me that you have a false. <laughs> so, you really did have one all along. Yeah. So, um, so somehow I'd like to be able to do that and something that, you know, do some videos, which would be a more difficult thing now. And now it's now the combining of those two things and promoting one's music and giving an audience who might know about my ceramics access is, is uh, well, it's on my bucket list, let's put it that way. Uh, and, then, and then your music doesn't just, I mean, your, your involvement in the audio world doesn't just yeah. stop at music per se. I mean, you're extremely well known for your contribution to The Exorcist. Yes. Uh, um, audio effect. I'm sorry. In terms of audio effects, and, and I yeah. think that's it, they call you know, it. They used to call it beyond special the sound world. effects. Now they call it sound design. Sound design. The, the terms are always changing. I, that happened around 1972, and I was working with Jack Nietzsche, who was Phil Spector's arranger, and Neil Young, and, and Buffalo Springfield, and and a guy who I was signed to said, who would you like to produce this record? I said, it's got to be Jack. And so, Jack Nietzsche. Yes. And so he, he uh, introduced me and Jack heard some tracks. He says, OK, I'll do it. So he did three songs on the Bad Rice album, which came after the mystery trend. We did have a mystery trend uh, re-release uh, on Ace, which is an English British label. But, but um, the Bad Rise was stuff I was pretty much doing on my own with other musicians helping. 
mm -hmm. and Jack said he'd do it. So, I mean, one of the great experiences of my life was walking, walking in, you know, okay, strike up the band. And here's like the top 50 people of LA, you know, I mean, every name it's been on a Phil Spector record, you know, a full string section, horns, percussion, I'm like, oh my fucking god! I mean, I went <laughs> with chills. It was it was mind blowing. And Jack and I subsequently became friends, and um, I got him into ceramics for a while too. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, there's just been this back and forth, you know. And then, but but there also has been this reluctance on my part to to blend until until now when it seems like it's more okay because it's like well this guy does all these things you might, are you are you a dilettante or are you a renaissance man and i say right if you've only cool. got two choices <laughs> <laughs> so to get back to the exorcist jack knew the editor um bud smith and i was completely broke and uh just had a shitty job working at Rolling Stone reconstructing uh, office space. And um, he said, well, here, I'm gonna send you a Nagra, it's a portable tape recorder and just go out and get some sounds and see if you can put something together. D just try everything. And I did. And that's where I really learned most about recording. So with an engineer named Doc Siegel who worked a lot with uh, Neil Young and others. Um, they just, I, it was like getting a free education, you know, but coming up with stuff. So all uh, I try to come up with sources of material which were natural, like my dog or going to a slaughterhouse. And um, I didn't know how they were going to be put together, but I just started stacking these things together. And Billy Freak and the director flipped for it. So from then we went on to Cat People and by that time I was working with Scott and um, that worked out well too. Um, just using random stuff, you know, and then Jack might combine that <clears throat> in the case of uh, The Exorcist again, uh, combine that with some musical stuff, um, more traditional, but sort of glass harmonica, you know, ethereal kind of sounds. And just doing that was probably the most fun job I've ever had. Uh, I did, I was on it for a year post-production. So, so yeah, I'm probably telling you, to, talking too long. Or... No, I, but I think it's fascinating that, uh, again, I mean, we know artists who make music and somehow it's very uh, intentionally folded into their practice in in the in the broad sense of the word yeah and so when you learn about that artist's work eventually you learn that oh yes of course they have music they did music as well and yeah and you're not that case it's almost that there's this other guy with the same name as you who looks there like is you, another guy with the who same has, name who has this career in the music industry yeah they always think i'm two different guys and they're right <laughs> i mean that metaphorically <laughs> <laughs> but i think that's wonderful that you have i i i find it i mean maybe it doesn't seem so rich to you because it's your reality but to someone who's looked at your visual art all these years and i'm an ardent music fan i i, I listen yeah. to music and i collect music and i you know try to find out about music maybe yeah. not with quite the same intensity as art but it's a big part of my life so then to learn that ron nagel has this other life in yeah. which you know, there's music people who maybe don't even know that much about your artwork but uh yeah it works both from, ways from the more mystery and more recently, there are people who have come out of the woodwork and so yeah, I have a copy of Bad Rice, or I, I know you did this, or somebody in Australia will send me a t-shirt that they made specially for me of Linda Bear puking in the scene in the exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> I wear 
where'd this come from? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's flattering and I'm glad there's, you know, um, I love to do both things. I mean, there's no clear, I'd be nothing without music in terms of just my, my own spirit and and same thing with working. I mean, that's my therapy. Uh, I um, I went through some pretty dark periods of, you know, overindulgence, we'll say the, the party years of the 70s. And finally, after my daughter was born, I just quit doing that. And the only, the only habit I have is working on music and, and, and art. And if I can do that, I'm, you know, I'm relatively sane. I worry a lot about everything as my <laughs> studio manager and assistant would tell you, but uh, if I just sit down and start working, it's okay, you know. Uh, well, let's get into the visuals a little bit because yeah. I mean, we talked a lot in our initial um, uh, presentation. I think, um, Anya, if you can switch to the, yeah, great. Um, we talked a little bit in the tech. Um, I, I was mentioning to you that, you know, I was fascinated uh, with your early career and how you seem to have um, kind of entered the, the art world uh, first image please the first uh, visual image um with I, I don't want to say an already formed aesthetic but but it felt like you know with volkos with peter volkos being the background um it felt a lot like um yeah we're not getting the visual um well, that's going to come yeah, on in a second up in one sec. sorry about that someone with the slide share oh yeah but it, you can talk yeah, but it, yeah but it feels like you're taking what Volkos is doing, which on, on one level is a revolution in scale. Like she, he really shattered That's true. an idea about scale in ceramics. And it's almost like you took what he was doing and then you ran over into the opposite corner and said, I can create this feeling, but it doesn't have to be mass. It doesn't well, have I, to Well, when I was heavy. going to college before I met Pete, um, I did do a lot of big stuff, as I told you the other day. Um, there it is. Oh, this looks good. Um, LA County owns this piece. And, uh, I was so, so, so critical of myself during this period that I, there's a lot of stuff, early stuff that I, um, that I threw away or gave away or broke. And I'm, I'm kicking myself in the ass so again, for uh, young up and coming artists, you know, save everything, even if you don't have space, <laughs> because I thought, well, you know, when I get to be really good, whenever that is or was, uh, I'm not gonna want this stuff. Now I regret that I don't, but there's a few that have been, and I wasn't that prolific, but I should say that Pete had what would take elements of what he had done on the wheel or slabs and construct. And I was doing the same kind of thing in smaller scale. And I was influenced not by other ceramic people besides him and Kenny and Michael Frimbus, but people like Tapies, who I mentioned the other day, uh, like the perfume bottle uh, was, um, I think Tapies, rip off in a way, I, I suppose. Uh, um, who else? Um, well, him in particular, but then also Kenny and... Um, Ken Price. Ken Price, and there were several European people that, uh, uh, that I really was fond of. So, I mean, I would just wait by the library door at in the art department when I was at, at working with Peter Berkeley for the first for the newest edition of Art International to come in or Simnese or one of the, you know, it is, I, those were all like big magazines at the time. It's pre, pre art forum. And I'd look at all of the, uh, there was another guy I liked a lot I was very uh, pretty unknown called Julius Bessier. I don't know if you know sure. him. Of course. Oh, good for you. He's, he doesn't get enough cheese for, for, for me. But. And then uh, 
Fautrier? Jean Fautrier, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is I all mean, considered the, what's, uh, I mean, it's often described as the informalist generation, the, the generation that um, rejected any notion of, of formal rules. Yeah. Uh, and, and then. Part, and in that sense, it was, it was a rejection of surrealism in geometric I, Yeah. Although, ironically enough, if I was, and I, I forgot to mention, I what the, I don't know what's wrong with me here. My main man was Morandi. So Giorgio Morandi, you know, both his paintings in terms of actually being able to create a mood. It was about mood. It wasn't about formal issues. In fact, he denounced that himself personally, that he was not, he wouldn't call it at the time a formalist. But then as the 80s came along, you know, if you weren't doing something that was politically oriented or whatever the case may be, then you'd be put down for, oh, he's just a formalist. And after all this time, particularly with the new work, I think I kind of think myself more as a surrealist in a way. Uh, I mean, there's, it's considered formally, but it's all down to how it feels and creating maybe contradictions. It's, something you can't quite put your finger on. Yeah, and I think that there's this um, elusiveness um, about, yeah. the, about the reference where you, you have this American Legion you know, slogan, but it's not used the way a pop artist would use a commercially recognized you know, logo or icon. It's upside down, it's pushed to the edge. <laughs> it doesn't really have a function. I mean, no. it's, not, it's not, you can't sort of discuss the relationship between you know the heart-shaped form on the right and the american legion star although i suppose you could but it, you know the i think the idea is it leads you down an alley of suggestiveness of, of yeah not of conclusion. And i'll be honest with you at the time um i had no idea except it just felt good to do that i mean my mother had a ceramic club and I don't know where she got the American Legion decals, but I started and the heart shape has always been a, a big thing for me. Uh, I got married on Valentine's Day 50 years or so ago. And so that double hump or maybe the camel hump or the heart, pardon me, the heart shape, it always finds itself in some way and I don't know why and I equate this I, when people ask me about that to uh, close encounters where, you know, guys building a sculpture out of mashed potatoes and he doesn't know where it's coming from. And there's this other source out there that he's not even aware of. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, I just did it. I was like, yeah, that guy looks pretty good. The other thing I thought, I think now in retrospect, is that we were, Kenny was the first guy to actually introduce color into ceramics. And I kind of followed his lead um, and eventually, you know, started doing strictly um, earthenware. This happens to be stoneware with a low fire glaze on it, but this enigmatic kind of, or almost contradictory quality, um, it's, it just keeps, cropping up, you know, so it's my job to kind of recognize that if something's happening and I can't quite figure it out, you know, it's about how it feels, so. Well, okay, what's, what were your circumstances in 1958, the year you made this piece? I mean, where were you and what were you doing? Uh, I was working with Volkus at the time. Uh, I didn't get into graduate school. But then he, he hired you, right? What? <laughs> but then he hired you. Or, or, yeah, he just looked at me and, and straight ahead and just said, you don't want to go to school. Because he had a program, which he called the auditor's program, where he would let what he referred to as non-matriculating students, which means you could climb in the window at night and give and the janitor a half pint and say, just let me work <laughs> all night. And he started that tradition in L.A., so he says, I'll tell you what, I need somebody to mix clay and I'll give you a little place for a studio. And I mean, I owe it all to him, you know. Prior to that, I'd only seen a few things, but even when I saw 
stuff that was in a ceramic show that he made. It just had a feel that nobody else could do. The other thing in reference to me going off in another direction was that nobody could do, despite those who tried to imitate after a long time, trying to make stuff that looked like Pete or do the Volcus um, style, if you will, they could, nobody could pull it off. It has to do with, it does have to do with style, a certain touch, a certain attitude, a certain feel, you know, that, so I said, hey man, that lane is taken, you know, to speak in contemporary terms. <laughs> and, well, it's funny because, yeah, I mean, John Mason or Stephen DeStabler, I mean, we're yeah. really people that I think we're trying to replicate that scale. You know, that uh, yes, big massive volume, and right. you and Ken Price went the other way. You, you, yeah, you sort of, you know, I, I, when I look at this now and think, you know, you're in your twenties, you're just, you know, beginning to form your style, and I think uh, it's, it reads to me as very poignant. You know, there's just a whole lot of vulnerability. I would say that I'm, I'm sort of. Uh, picking up on when I look but at this that's, piece. That's good to hear, man. I mean, because I mean, that's that's a, a, an emotion. And that's the kind of reaction I want people to feel when they see the work. You know, it's not like, okay, this ought to get them, you know. I mean, it's got to do with emotional appeal or disdain or whatever it is, but it's, you know, um, the, the qualities that I respect the most are work that that has that, but uh, you know, that people can respond to emotionally. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, well, can we go on to the second piece? Cause I, I think that it, it continues to be in the work yeah. that you develop. I mean, this is, this piece just breaks my heart. <laughs> it breaks my heart too, because I gave it to a good friend of mine, a guy <laughs> named Ed Burrell, who was a uh, LA artist and then came up here and he fucking lost it. I don't know where it is. I said, Ed, where is this piece? You know, and I gave it to him because I, you know, liked his work so much and we became best friends and stuff. And so, you know, so I was throwing in a little Julius Bessier, uh, mm -hmm. making stuff, making components like the base, the body and the handle. Uh, and here so, I see tapias. I also see tapias. Yeah, can, it's in there. It's definitely in there. Wash form. And the profile hard. became very important uh, also. I mean, so I always refer to my work having an A side, although kind of stuff I'm doing now, it's that I'm kind of go, alluding to inside outside, but that's, that's up the road here. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, I like this piece a lot. And uh, it may be edifying. What? Maybe it'll turn up. Uh, I, I've asked him many years for, <laughs> for many years. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, maybe he's out. Maybe he's listening right now and he's going to put yeah, it around it. Be. But the other thing I want to call people's attention to is four inches high. So yeah. you're making this, you know, as a serious artist and you're committed. Um, but d did no one tell you that this was the age of? heroic scale in American art that, 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 you know, Pollock had introduced the mural scale and that everything had to be big and expansive, like, 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 like manifest destiny. <laughs> and oh, you're, well, you're sort of saying like, you that none of that stuff appealed to me. I mean, I hate David Smith. Uh, you hate I, David Smith? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, for, for, uh, I'm not a Henry Moore fan. Uh, there were other people that made bit larger sculpture like Brancusi or Arp, who I thought were great, but there's a difference for me, you know, in feel and approach and so forth. So, I mean, I just had to come to terms with the fact that I'm not a macho guy. I mean, Pete is, Pete was, he walked into a room and it just got silent. It was like Anthony Quinn or something walking in, you know, wearing flamenco boots. And then he would just say, blah, 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 blah. He'd talk in a kind of nonverbal way. <laughs> and it was just like, 
It was like meeting, you know, like a hero, a hero of mine, but I had to come to the conclusion, I, I can't do that. And I've tried making bigger stuff and um, I'm not good at it. I mean, you know, some of, a few big things I, I, I still like, uh, but I think I, it goes all the way back to when I was a kid, maybe around 12 when went to a hobby shop in a local uh, park and um, they were making model airplanes out of, uh, <clears throat> out of orange crates and then finishing them with lacquer. And then I'm going, man, I, I, I don't know, I felt some sort of an epiphany there. Like, how do you do that, man? How do you transform? So this whole idea of what became known in LA certainly not in San Francisco, as the Finnish fetish stuck with me. And through Ed, who used to own this piece, <laughs> he connected me with all the people in LA. So I did get to know Larry Bell and Billy Al Bankston and Kenny and I became really good friends. And uh, I- You were in the first stable at Ferris Gallery, weren't you? I mean, you were showing at Ferris right out of the gate, pretty much. I wasn't with Ferris. No, uh, sorry. But uh, Kenny, Larry. The other thing you have to remember in terms of sort of evolution is during the, during the 50s and the late 60s, I got to know Walter Hoffs later and uh, Irving Blum. But anyway, during that period, everybody was so fucking youth conscious. If you didn't make it, by the time you were 21, you, it was over. I mean, that's what that was the consciousness of the time. And I started going, man, you better hurry up. You know, you're 20, and, you, and they're, they're going to pass you. Running out. <laughs> I never had, if I had any idea at all, you know, I'd still be doing this. I'm 82 now, and I still have the same enthusiasm for work and for working, um, but. I and your mean, ideas about time are probably different as well. What's that? Your ideas about time have probably. Uh, you mean tick, tick, tick. <laughs> <laughs> if you live, your time will come. <laughs> well, Ron, you know, I think if you haven't made it by the time you're 95, it's really time to throw. <laughs> you're fucked. <laughs> it's, no, it's, but this is also which, under, which I just, you know, blows my mind. I mean, there was a time I couldn't afford it, but you could buy a Mirandi for 75 bucks, you know, in the 50s, probably, he'd give them away. I mean, you know, then later on, and maybe in the 90s, you know, 100,000. And he's still, to me, one of the most underpriced artists at auction that there is. I mean, those are gorgeous. I mean, there's not that many works. Vuillard's another, somebody else I'm nuts about. Um, for the mystery I think the sense, I, mean, I think if we move on a little bit, I think we can get the sense of a thread of comparison um, w with Mirandi and your work. I know you don't want yes. to put it that explicitly, but I, I feel like, you know, going back to the source each time, like starting from zero with each sculpture, yeah. I think is a really important principle in your work. And I think it's something you see in Mirandi that he looks at this arrangement on a table and it's if he's never seen an arrangement of things before in his life he paints his still life as if it's the only painting that he'll ever make in his life yeah uh, and then he'll turn around and do, do it again um but the idea of starting from zero i i think is um something i pick up in your in your work right around this time in the 70s where it yeah. just feels like there's an entire universe in this very small intimate thing well, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. Every once in a while, I go out into left field. I mean, if the piece we're seeing now, um, Frank Lloyd Cup, uh, which sort of looks like the Guggenheim influence, uh, ar architectural or architectonic or archimetric, where we could make up our own categories here. I would do something like that and then go back to the hands-on with the two prior pieces that you've shown 
Um, and this is when I started changing technically, getting into slip casting where I could do things that I couldn't do by hand building. And I hate talking technique, but for those clay buffs out there, uh, you know, I, I changed my technique technique once in a while because I couldn't I couldn't possibly have this kind of precision, if you will, by you know hand built. So I'll go back and forth or combine the two. I mean, I think more recently uh, I've combined the two of part casting and uh, part it says Frank Lloyd Cup is a masterpiece. Where'd that come from? I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a, it's a obviously it's your fan base ron my fan base john john bergeron owns that who's the best dealer in town oh. here oh yes uh, um, was to the next slide, i'm can. sorry i want to just move on a little bit to the next slide um, yeah so it's beginning with works like these in the early 80s that, that, that the idea that it's an entire world becomes even more, I don't know, to me, explicit. I mean, I see this as being like a liminal um, a threshold into a world. It is. And, and, you know, it's all there. Everything that you need to understand this world is in this eight inch high well, uh, object. You've packed so much in there. Um, and that narrative quality to it i think is not really talked about that much in your work no and i mean i didn't i didn't think that i was ever narrative and the more i look at this stuff or talk with somebody like yourself uh i it makes more sense to me i uh, i was basically copping licks from various uh what shall i say um Various stylistic. I mean, there's some deco in there. There's a lot of there's fifties in there. There's uh, oh, the stuff was kind of like a Louis Berrigan. We talked about him. Uh, there's also a little opening, as if you, if if you want to put exactly. in exactly uh, the, the opening at the top. People who would review my work or criticize it or whatever cannot get used to the idea at the time that there's a hole in the top, which was basically my being somewhat ornery about, okay, I want to show you that this is hollow, although it has the appearance of being solid in a way. So it's like a, almost like a shell, but also tipping my hat to the fact that all of this stuff grew loosely out of a vessel format and so somebody reviews this and said if it, it wouldn't it, it, it can't be real sculpture because it's got a hole it almost invites floral insertion <laughs> <laughs> i said i think you have me confused with somebody else i won't mention <laughs> a different kind of artist that must be robert maplethorpe that he's <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> So well, you know, I wasn't going to point out the similarities there, but <laughs> well, if you I mean, there's it. a certain stylistic uh, whatever, but the, also I think the, none of these things stood up totally um, vertically. They have a little lean to them, which That's I right. call that keep on trucking. You know, with arc from Mr. Uter, whatever it was, and they had to look like they were going somewhere. So there's a certain implied motion. And um, like streamline. Yeah, streamline would be a very good uh, word for that. Uh, let's this, move on to the next one, into the, a little deeper into the 80s. Um, yeah. Well, actually, now we're already in the 90s. But I, th this piece just, I, I, it just amazes me. Because again, it, it feels like, I, okay, my thought process when I look at something like this is that, you know, this comes from a distant world a, a civilization somewhere and the civilization that it comes from has been wiped out it's gone and the <laughs> only thing that's remaining are you is looking this into object. the picture <laughs> <laughs> and somehow from this one object we'll be able to reconstruct everything that we need to know about the civilization that created it wow. i mean i know my, my imagination runs wild that's good it has, it has this good. 
the specificity to it yeah, that I'm thinking. Well, this all must add up to something. It must mean something. Well, there must be a story. I, I, I can say that my sources uh, on a formal or vi visual level, besides what I want them to feel like, and people have said that about my work all along, this sort of otherworldly thing. Again, not intentional, but I would say the images come from, uh, um, the general images come, come from cartoon uh, sources, drawings. Uh -huh. uh, George Harriman, I mentioned, is a huge, huge fan of George Harriman. One of the most underrated and great artists. Crazy Cat. Did. Crazy Cat. And so that and maybe, um, I don't know, you know, I'll go, I'll go back to my double hump kind of riff up at the top there. <laughs> the look. This is an early hairdo wear, uh, which uh, sort of looks like a head, but maybe some puffs coming out down at the bottom. I don't know. I just, I draw a lot. So I'll draw, you know, tons and draw, of drawings and then something will start making a little sense and then we'll convert that um three three dimensionally but other people other art people i remember betty woodman saw this piece and said wow this is something else the other thing which was uh different about this this is cast porcelain so that green color you're seeing is coming from within the body itself the clay body itself it's not a glaze except when we get over to uh, the red and uh, black, those are glazes, and then the, the yellow pinstripe. So um, the source of the coloring changes throughout the piece. It, it, cha it changes both in surface and in quality. So there's, um, there's that. And this is a piece that's definitely meant to be, have an A side. This is the angle you want to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had this piece. I don't know who's got this. Maybe the doesn't matter. Uh, I was a collector in Detroit, the Frankels, and they have a lot of my work. Anyway, oh, sure. this is uh, this is a piece I am fond of. Was this in the Berkeley show? Okay. Yeah, let's let's move ahead into the more current work because we have just a couple more uh, pieces. Lobster Boy, uh, which came yeah. out a little while ago. Somebody on the chat section was really fascinated with this piece. I am too. The, the texture that you create just seems otherworldly to me. Yeah. Um, well, this is probably my favorite of what became known as the Thin Fins. Uh, the imagery came from a, a book called Lobster Boy, uh, which was from a guy which is too long a story to go into, but had hands like a lobster. Yeah. And, and uh, I, my wife got me the book. It was one of those books, like people would see it in the bookstore, thumb through it, get the pages dirty, and then put it back on the shelf. <laughs> she said, no, I know somebody who would want to own this book. So she bought the book for me. And this is inspired by an autopsy photo of Lobster Boy. And I've become incredibly uh, obsessed with lobster, period. For example, that uh, there's a Seinfeld episode where man hands, does anybody know that this one? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. Woman reaches across and goes, uh, and his girlfriend, yeah. Um, <laughs> just when their hands touch. <laughs> and this when their hands touch, he, he, he recoils, I guess you'd say. <laughs> he goes, oh, she has man hands. <laughs> oh, and he was, you know, so kind of suddenly getting into, I don't know, is that misogyny or uh, gender profiling <laughs> or whatever, but it wasn't, that's not what I was thinking about. I was just, it was funny as hell, you know. Well, I think it's rampant crack. speciesism. Is that what it is? Speciesism. And then she's cracking the cracking the lobster with her hands like this, breaking it, and it's brutal. But you don't get the payoff. I'm a huge uh, 
you know, curb your enthusiasm, Seinfeld. But anyway, that's another rep. I got, and I have a, a Lobster Boy poster behind. I know, I can see it right behind you. Can you see it? Oh, good. Yep, it looks that great. was one of the original things from the, I don't know, one of the 40s, 50s. Uh, so anyway, the piece itself, the surface you're referring to is a technique. I'm going to tell everybody how I do this. Uh -oh. <laughs> or maybe I shouldn't. Maybe it should be a secret. Should it be a secret? I'm talking to Whitney, who I cannot do anything without. She's been working together with me for the last 11 years. And, and she's briskly shaking her head saying, don't. Yeah, she's together. kicking me under the table and it really hurts. <laughs> No, she didn't kick. <laughs> but uh, let's move on though to the current show because I do want to talk about the new pieces, and I'm sure people who haven't seen the show yet, um, I love this piece. But let's let's not linger because we can. Okay. We can get to the new piece. Oh, I really want to linger on this one, but here we go. Okay. <laughs> Only the homely. Now, I, I said he I said homely. He said, homely. only the homely. <laughs> but don't forget, I, here's something I got to say. One of the high meetings of my life was meeting Roy Orbison in person while he was recording a soap commercial. I'll just leave it at that. But I'm a big, you know, great writing, great records. Anyway, go ahead. Great falsetto. Oh, my <laughs> God. Incredible falsetto. Scary. So your, your, your titles now are very punning. You know, there's always like a, yeah. a joke, um, and I and I'm seeing the stage. Not, I don't want to call it a stage, but I'm seeing the way that you know different proportions, different shapes and forms relate to each other. Um, it's not so much that it's narrative per se anymore. It's become a little bit more um, episodic, almost cinematic. Yeah, like, yeah, it, like opera. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Uh, but you don't think of the of miniature, I mean, miniature, the, the idea of something being a miniature is not of interest to you, really. I mean, no, it's a form of things. I try to not consciously go after it, but find things that are, in, I guess you'd say incongruous. Uh, that you've probably seen in one form or another, it could be three-dimensional, two-dimensional, or iconic quote images, and put them together in a way that is, I, I would have to say, probably an implied narrative. Um, and I, I, that's really about all I can do. You know, once things get going, it's like any any other artist or many others is you just start with something and start building from it. It might be just that 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 little chunky piece in the corner, which kind of has a rock like influence and like what the hell is that doing with the shelf over there on the left? And and we did you know Whitney and I. Uh, have a meeting and say, okay, what do you think? Is this good? Does this look good? You know, sometimes I'll doubt myself frequently and say, until we we'll just move things around until it feels right, you know. And um, so that's the story with that. And it's all, I'm sorry. We, no, I was just, I was having a little offline conversation. I want to move on to the next image because, again, I, I feel like there's an inherent drama in the piece itself. And it's all, I feel like there's a sense of expectancy um, that's, that's going on where, you know, there's one more element or something has just happened or something is just about to happen. Yeah. But, but there's, there's drama. Also, in, um, so an erotic side to this, which many of my pieces have, if that's what you call it, erotic imagery or whatever. Uh, um, I did several, I'll, I'll, I will usually do maybe up to five using a, a similar theme. Um, in this case, I think this became more compressed in terms of simplicity and um, 
maybe the color implies something happens. I don't know if I'm, I'm delighted that you're getting all of this, you know, out of what I'm doing, because this is what I've always ex wanted, you know, is the people. I mean, I've had other people who weren't even art people says, I'm looking at these things and I don't know, it's making me feel something. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's good. So if you're getting that out of there, that's really good. That's good. I can't again explain it. They just evolve and I'll keep working on it. And sometimes I'll doubt myself, sometimes frequently. You made reference to the titles also uh th that's where the songwriting comes comes across i think in terms of things like alliteration or cadence um uh, what else would we say uh i don't know I, they just have to sound good and then we'll line up line up we, we constantly have titles and then we will give a title to the piece. I say it's, you know, like naming your dog. It has nothing. And, uh, you know, in a perverse way, it's to throw people off a little bit so that they actually bring their own interpretation to it and not say, oh, it has this in the title. So that means, because it, it's like, you know, if you give somebody a title that they can interpret too, too explicitly or too literally, like watching a bad docent at a museum who's <laughs> explaining it means the wine has been drunk but yet the shoe has does not <laughs> <laughs> the fuck oh, I say, fire that and they all do it i mean it's terrible and so it just perpetuates misinformation and nobody talks about feeling i mean i have all this piece stuff that I like has got to do with, again, may perhaps thought of as a, a not important word, but style or the vibe is very, very important. And if you can bring a, a narrative or expectation to it, that, that's really what I, that's what I hope happens for people. Um, next image, please. I mean, I think we can also say that we're sort of living in an age of overkill. And, you know, we're bombarded with, you, you know, the whole story and the denouement and the sequel and the prequel all at once. Yeah. And, and yeah. this is about suggestiveness. It's about, you know, sort of using your imagination to complete or to fill in the picture, you know, to yep. create the narrative that you think is, you know, fitting to this atmosphere. And yet you've created the atmosphere so sort of perfectly that it's, it's hard to not after you've been looking at it for a little while to start to imagine what's going to happen when someone steps out of that, you know, opening in the, in the wall or, yeah. or someone steps out from behind the wall or, you know, the yeah. thing, that the well, thing about that's, really, that's good. This is where I get into a, sort of an implied dark side a little bit, you know, is having that cut out. So the, it, I guess it, you know, it does imply that there's those are walls and that something might be happening in fact i'm working on a series now where you'll get a peek at something from behind the opening um and this is also a combination i think of sort of 50s style splattering you can barely see it it's pretty subtle with the red uh, color is really important to me, but again, it's it's how it feels and putting together combinations that are maybe not expected. Um, I'm huge on gold. Gold goes with everything. <laughs> so I guess, uh, gold and black, probably. Uh, you can always, when, when in doubt, you have to throw that in there. And then it goes, oh, that feels ridiculous. Get rid of that. And then we put the components together and um, they're glued together with industrial kind of, you know. But I see somebody up here saying like a gold filling and that's true. <laughs> I thought now, that too. Am I gonna get a copy of all these comments? Cause I love, but I, it's diff, or, or, or are they gonna, you're gonna read them back to me or? 
I see a lot of future titles for work sexually floating by on the comment section. Um, download them. Let's go. <laughs> pardon me, Anya. We can save them. Yeah, we can Good. save them and, and send them to you for sure. Um, I wanted to look at one more if we can um, before we go to questions, I guess. Yeah, this piece I really, you know, I really love. Um, and oh. I, I think the you know, sort of like the suggestiveness really pushes it towards Morandi. It's like an erotic Morandi. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree. I mean, there's, there, it's very minimal. Uh, there's basically three formal elements. I mean, this is like one of those outside inside things that I was talking about. Uh, the uh, tan uh, shade, shade is is, um, is porcelain, and the color it's it's dull porcelain, so it's coming from uh, um, you can buy it at the store, you know, at the ceramic store. So you get these sort of flesh tones, and. Uh, it's cast and it's hollow. So you kind of get this igloo kind of thing going. And then I just wanted to make something where the drips doing the impossible, you know, kind of, and it also sets up a sort of spatial thing along with what you, with this, I think this and several other pieces, the one before that you were referring to, somebody wrote me a, a card and said, it looks like a detective mystery it's, you can, but the detectives trying to figure out what's going on and gather clues. I mean, another friend of mine said, there's a little darkness to this show. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not consciously trying to make a commentary, although I'm very affected emotionally by what's been going on in the last few years. But, you know, I, I think I, I couldn't pull it off if I was trying. But I just trying to put something together and I was like, yeah, that feels good. Yeah, that's so anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm fond of this piece also. Then these little dots I got going are just to sort of subtly fill in the space and kind of has a Mirandi-esque, maybe a little Fontana, maybe a little um, Tapie. So I'll go back to my old favorites. Uh, I am influenced by other artists' work, but try not to directly lift it, you know, and, and the, the, those influences are pretty diverse, I think. Uh, you know, I, I promised we wouldn't get into wonky talk here, but I did notice that you're working with a material that I have never seen an artist use before, which is catalyzed polyurethane. Um, which sounds like something that you have to do in a laboratory um, under very <laughs> controlled conditions. I wish my studio looked like a laboratory. <laughs> it's like Francis Bacon or something. They just shit everywhere. And we have to clean it up. Oh, that, that's it's car paint. Right? Oh. Car paint. When I started, I learned a lot from car customizing in the 50s when I was a kid. And um, at that time, they used with, with lacquer in this organic right. sense. And so you, it's all out of 48 Ford poop and you'd paint it, paint it, and then you'd rub it down and you'd paint it. And like, I have 40 coats of uh, this deep, you know, lacquer obsessive kind of surface. And then they <clears throat> took it off the market for health reasons, environmental reasons. And so um, that's, that's People where- People were foolishly inhaling it, right? Yes, they were. And that, that it was pre-glue or pre-whatever. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And so that, that is my attempt to create a glaze-like surface without using glaze. Um, and then the shape underneath it, let's see, I think that is cast, they're both cast. There's a lot of cast elements, but the urethane is, uh, oh, somebody's saying, curious about, uh, oh, I don't know. Okay, oh, you gotta send me these quotes. This is 
wonderful to hear what people are thinking. Anyway. <laughs> um, well, you know, um, I was thinking, the other thing I wanted to throw out to you is this quote that I really like from Dave Hickey, who I think was, you know, I, I think really important to you in terms of embracing your work. Exactly. Beauty at a very critical time. And something he said about you that stuck with me was, um, I don't quite know what to make of the quote, is uh, Nagel's uh, trick is false modesty. <laughs> uh, and and, and I, I find that very, very intriguing thing to say, because of course, well, um, what he's saying is you're not really modest at all. And that, <laughs> and that the sculptures are not I'm really humble yeah, at all. Well, I'm sorry, what was the last part? I um, it, it, well, no, also that the work is is not falsely modest. I mean, or maybe the work is, but you, it, it all seems to be very, very ambitious, but it's kind yeah. of secretively ambitious. Well, I think he hit the nail on the head. He also said, which from another review or whatever, that I was a better songwriter than him. He writes songs and stuff. He's coming from a rock background. So that, that I think a lot of us owe a great, great deal to Dave for bringing beauty into the equation in the '90s, and they everybody thought he was joking. And uh, it's so great to have him on my side. I can tell you, I mean, he broke a lot of barriers. False modesty. I I I've run through that. It's a great quote. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I would, when I think about false modesty, it would be if somebody said, I really love this piece. It makes me think, blah, 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 whatever. Anything you said, and I go, oh, it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's false modesty. These things are ambitious as hell, despite their, <laughs> I mean, it's not like I'm driven. I mean, there is a quality and certain artists and creative people where they don't protect, they have a lot of talent. There's another hot word, but, but, but they're driven by ambition. And I'm, you know, yeah, I hope these sell. I hope people love them, whatever. But um, when you point this out, I think, Dave's quote becomes more relevant as time goes on. Uh, I don't know. Exactly. I mean, I think the unassuming, I think it points to the unassuming nature of the work. I mean, I was watching people in your show on Saturday and people kept, I mean, the typical viewer who, did, who wouldn't necessarily know your work, which was most of the people I figured that I was watching, it takes them a little while to discover something, you know, to yeah. see a deep that sticks out at them. And then once they start pointing details out to each other, yeah. that's it, you've got, you know, they're, oh. they're your cat uh, from that oh. point on. And, and I think that's a fascinating, way, like the accumulation of clues that you talked about before, um, I think is a really big part of how people come to understand your work. Well, yeah, that, that quality of their response, I draw a parallel to that in, in my music or any good record, which is, you know, if, they, if you don't grab them in the first eight bars, forget about it. I mean, it's got to be constructed to have appeal and to make you want to go further and listen and build and all that kind of stuff. And I think if people don't get it, that's okay. And then they can bring their own thing to it. And that's what I want. And that's why a lot of these things are like, what the hell is a shadow knocker? I, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, and then, and then if they try to put it together, you know, if I have the opportunity or somebody else, it, it doesn't have, it doesn't mean anything. And yet it will mean a lot. Right, within so the context of the, of, the, of the piece itself, you can say, well, we, you know, it means something within the logic of the piece. Yeah, the people understand exactly. Better, exactly. But not an hour. I mean, you know, that's why I started thinking maybe I'm a surrealist. You look at Marguerite, and I'm going, "What the hell is this sky doing with this other thing?" And you know, they, they don't they don't make sense together. But yet, it takes you to another level of understanding that's not logical in a in a way. And I, 
that appeals to me. And, well, I see some Eve Tangi in this. And I, oh, I, yeah. I also think those, I think those holes are very Tapias or Fontana is. I think I mean I think the illusions are there. And gay is good, yeah, yeah. Um, listen, we've got a pile up of questions here, and so I think that that maybe it's the perfect time to shift over to things that your your fan base are clamoring. <laughs> now I've got uh, you to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think it's Anya is going to be um, calling on people to actually ask the questions. Mm -hmm. in their own voice yeah i'll um be moderating or you know is that it Great. for me and dan well I, i'm still here but you're you're on the spot now ron well i want to thank you for asking good questions and getting me to talk without misbehaving myself so. <laughs> <laughs> there'll still be time for misbehaving okay <laughs> be time for misbehavior yeah okay so, That's there we go <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, this has been a really excellent conversation to listen to. Thank you. I'm really enjoying myself. Um, and Me I, too. Yeah, I'm glad. I can tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> our first question will come from G.E. Schwartz. And you should be able to unmute. Thank you. I, I first heard about you when I got on a, when I was at a, at a college campus years ago and the tubes came through. And I got on the bus to interview her for the college newspaper, and I was talking to Ree Styles. Yeah. And I said, uh, I said, so, so who's this guy, Ron Daigle, who co-wrote that song, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, she told me who you were. And then she said, you know, he's also a sculptor. And I go, oh, man. So after that, I had to find out who you were, and I've been following you as much as I could ever since, you know. Well, thank you for that. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, thank, thank Reese Stiles, you know, for, for hitting me, because Fee Wable was kind of not talkative that day. But anyway, um, the question I had was, the thing I've always been really struck with is the humor that you have that has a tinge of menace to it. And, yeah. um, and, and I wonder, where does that come from? Uh, I was raised in a household where the boogeyman was just around the corner. And it was a, a fear-based... Uh, childhood. Uh, to this day, uh, I, uh, that quality has affected my emotional life, unfortunately, and it's difficult to shake. Uh, I would also say that uh, B movies, uh, particularly like Charlie Chan and, uh, oh, you know, noir. I was always drawn to those because I used to go see them every Saturday matinee when I was a kid. So that, for some reason, you know, uh, it's in there. You, you, I'm glad you saw it. I mean, because sometimes I think, am I, is this too dark or whatever? But there's this, there's this balance between joy and darkness that I'm not trying to consciously do um, in terms of Don't Touch Me There, that was inspired by a story which is not, uh, well, let's just say a friend of mine in high school went to Mexico and met some people, and whatever. Uh, <laughs> it, took <on> bigger, <laughs> it took on bigger meaning. Uh, as time goes on, because a lot of people think it refers to touching them emotionally or spiritually or whatever, you know, and, and, and boundaries and stuff like that, if you would to. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> no, no, but it, it really could, I really connect with it for some of the same things and the reason of your biography that you went through. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much for that question. Uh, our next question will come from Sharakat Kazarian. And yeah, there you are. Hi, hello. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, looking at your sculptures, I've been thinking a lot uh, about uh, the sculptor ceramist George Orr, the mad potter yeah. of the Oxy, as he would call himself, because of the scale, the eroticism the misbehavior and the ambition. So I've been wondering um, if you had been interested in him and in which period and what do you think? Okay. 
Yes, yes, I am interested. Yes, he was way ahead of his time. And most of us like ceramics or not, uh, only discovered him after somebody found all these pots, these pots in a garage um, somewhere in the, in the South, I can't remember. Uh, Mississippi. Yeah, Mississippi. And uh, he, in his own way, helped legitimize, I think, the ceramic movement as people like Jasper Johns actually painted George York um, pots in some of his paintings many years back. Uh, in terms of his behavior or his life story, I mean, he was, uh, I think he was an ornery guy and probably had fun doing it. I mean, he, you know, he had a sign when he, maybe you alluded to this, but uh, when he'd go out and at ceramic shows, it'd say, world's greatest potter, you prove the contrary. So he drew the line, the line in this, in the clay, so to speak. And he was, he was incredible, you know. The best George R pieces are the large, uh, the larger red ones, uh, which are pretty hard to find. And he, only a couple of um, people have a, a ton of George R stuff. Um, what else? I, I curated a George R show when I was teaching at Mills College. Oh, with wow. With the art director, and we had a we flew out to New York, and there were two major collectors there. One who wouldn't let us borrow the pieces, which I don't blame him, and the other was very generous with the loans. But it was the first first George R. show on the West Coast, and so I'm definitely, I mean, in terms of formally, the thinness, the delicacy, the implied erotic qualities, uh, you know. I'm right there with them. And it's again, like so many artists, um, well, what took you so long to discover this guy? You know, I mean, he's not benefiting by it. So I guess the, the garage was closed. Yeah. So some time to open the doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. And then he had a big fire and was going to quit. Yes. And I think one of his kids died. I mean, it was it's tragic. So it's one of those deals like, gee, do you really have to cut your ear off to make good stuff or what? <laughs> and I worry about that. <laughs> so far I got my, <clears throat> anyway, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Elizabeth Blake. You should be able to speak. Hi, um, my question was just about the installation of the show. Yes. Um, you, ha you had mentioned um, that you were inspired by Fontana and Mirandi, but when I look at your pieces, I see uh, older Italians, like I see the work of Ghiberti and the sort of way that you're creating space and um, the forms. And I was wondering if there was any intention, the back wall, which it, it has a feel to me of San Marco and Florence of these monk cells, this very sort of pristine environment with these uh, pieces and set with electrifying colors in them. I was wondering okay. if there is any intention of reverence in, in your work when you display it. Um. Okay, let's see. First of all, I must say, I mean, there's many, uh, you know, way older artists that I dig, but, uh, and me, <laughs> meaning from the period you mentioned, uh, it's not conscious on my part, you know, there's, in terms of the, the uh, the installation, some of the pieces are meant to be, as I mentioned to Dan, where the profile is the most important thing. And there really is, to use a musical analogy, an A side. And um, I want people, so, and then what you said, which is also true, I'm actually 
in the more recent work, creating a back wall in which these other things are, are happening. So I'm creating sort of two-dimensional space out of three-dimensional. Somebody mentioned there's a, a reveal in the new art forum. I don't know if it's online and somebody refers to that. I, I didn't think about that, but this two-dimensional, three-dimensional thing, and I think it comes from Mirandi, uh, where his stuff is like, you know, all three-dimensional stuff and it's flattened out. What I want to do is flip that around and put a few elements and hopefully the right combination of elements will conjure up, you know, what I say alludes to a narrative or a semi or whatever. I'll have to look at other, there, there's a lot of pieces that I, you know, that I think are fantastic, right? And, you know, um, and probably not the ones that, uh, I remember one of the examples of that, I went to the, to the Louvre to see, and everybody was hovered around the Mona Lisa and I just, and it was like, wow, I mean, it's okay, but I turned the corner and there's a Mirandi and nobody's even looking at it. It pissed me off. <laughs> so, uh, but there are, you know, there's, there are some, a lot of Renaissance and I, people that I really dig and, uh, and then, uh, you know, moving further into current times or whatever, uh, but older. I mean, I like people like Satine or Corot. Uh, Corot in particular, some beautiful dark stuff um, that just draws me right in. Like you want to go right into that. I'm thinking about the landscapes in this case. So, uh, that's that's my story. <laughs> Stick <into it. laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, our next question will come from James Iveson. Um, and you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, um, hi. hi. Uh, I have noise in the background. I, hearing Ron talk about Weard and Mirandi and all these, I'm a painter. But I'm just thinking, Ron, when I get to look at a painting in a room, it can be on the wall and, you know, it can ignore us and we can then look at it as a, as a, sculpt, as a sculpture, as an object, do you, and, and in your house or in a plinth how, or, or in a museum, do you have things about the kind of viewing experience of these objects, like how they're seen in space? Yes. And, how that, and, 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 I, and that kind of... And how you cope with that in terms of um, of like the ideal situation, and then the plinth and the box. And I don't know if you look at Franz West much, but I always think Franz West conquered this problem so well because he's so relaxed about it. But your thing seems so well made; it's hard to be so relaxed about things that people can break and touch. So that's a lot yeah. of things. Sorry, but I'm throwing them out there. If you don't. <laughs> kind of a question. Okay. First of all, I can't see you. I heard. Hey. There you are. Hi. <laughs> Do I know you from Instagram? Uh, maybe, maybe, may, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Your name I... is familiar to me. Oh, okay. So, um, but we're, we're, anyway, it doesn't matter. Now I can see you and we can yeah. talk artist to artist. Um, Franz West, I, I, in some ways, I identify with him. I mean, I think there's a, a funky quality or a brute quality. One of the people that I failed to mention talking with Dan was, was Gustin. I'm a huge Gustin fan. So there's what I call the clunk factor. They just look, Franz West is more, has this clunk, like I don't give a shit kind of thing, but there's something appealing about those. And of course, the difference is also, um, scale, you know, um, so, um, no, it, 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 it head me back to the, the maybe the, your question. Well, just that, um, that, uh, like raking light, like when you look at a Mirandi, 
you, you don't actually a real one when you get to see the real one yeah. your, head, your head you see it from three quarters and then you move around it and you see that it's made of lead paint and it has and the weird frames he makes they become objects in the real world again but but how you have that experience of a thing that is three-dimensional so I don't know like and you're saying about the backs like is there like if they were placed in a niche in the wall uh, you know yeah. uh, and I more versus like on the mantelpiece or on the coffee table or in the corner of the room or in the middle of the room just sometimes I think Franz West shoves all the plinths in a good location so that yeah. it, it, it keeps the vibe in where the plinths are you know but and just that kind of well that's um that's I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen the show currently I have I'm in LA so I haven't managed oh, okay. to do it. I've seen images of the yeah, well, the, the most of my recent um, shows um, are have like a like a niche for the ones that I want to be sort of more profile oriented or deal with the A side, so that the audience really can't or the viewer can't get behind and see it. I mean, that's and if you look at like. Mag, uh, books of Japanese ceramics, there's always a picture of the A side. And my, my, one of my influences is Shibuya, or the Moliyama period of Japanese 16th, 17th century uh, tea bowls, which I love. And when they're represented in print, which has been my biggest influence because none of that work leaves Japan, it's always an A side. So they're purposely set up. In addition to that, there's also a plinth with a, gla with a glass, not plexiglass, glass box around it. Um, so it depends on the piece. Uh, some of the newer pieces, uh, it, it's better if you get to walk around. It kind of enhances, even though there is an, an A side or a more active side or a side where there's this sort of implied narrative. There's this inside outside quality I've been messing around with, like he took a room and sliced it diagonally. So um, I haven't seen that much for Franz West in person. So I, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but anyway, do you show in LA? Yeah, I show with uh, South, South Willard. With Ryan, Quando. oh yeah, I, I know your name from somewhere. I know all those guys, yeah. and you know Ricky Swallow, and yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay, well, tell them, give them my regards. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm so glad you two could connect here. Um, our next question will come from Brooklyn Clay. You should be able to unmute. Hey, Ron. Uh, this is Anders and Jen here. We run a clay studio um, in Brooklyn. Thanks, uh -huh. for, thanks for the great talk. Um, we also both just recently saw the show that's up. And uh, I have a question that relates to emotion and feeling, which is something that you mentioned today. But I've also heard you mention it countless times, especially in a really great studio visit that you did with Apartmento. Um, and oh, yeah. yeah, I love that video. When I'm having like a down day, that's something that, that I watch and it gets me excited to go to the studio. Oh, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, you, you owe me one, pal. <laughs> I, uh, I owe you a lot more than that. But uh, so I'll get to my question. I'm wondering, um, so you talk about emotion and feeling and being able to trust that as being really important in the studio. And I know that it's true because it transfers through the work for me personally. Oh, um, I, it's like, it's an amazing thing to go through a show like what's up right now and have an emotional response to several pieces that are in there. But my question is, um, were you always able to trust emotion or feeling as a guide when you make work or was that like a built skill because I think about how hard that would be coming up with people like Kim Price and in the Vulcus studio where there is a lot of machismo 
in the air? Like, how do you navigate trusting feeling and, and emotion? Uh, it, it took me a while, but I would say, first of all, I discovered that the, the feeling aspect of encountering, whether it's uh, music or art, particularly music, is when I first discovered like doo-wop and rhythm and blues, like I felt something. I felt that was literally transported to another level. And my aspiration would be, God, I wish I could make some stuff that pe people felt that way about. And it sounds like I was some, somewhat successful. I didn't, I mean, there could only, Kenny wasn't macho that much. I mean, he was, a, he, and he was a jazz guy and I was a pop guy. So, but we became very good friends. And uh, Pete was, you know, I mean, his very presence was very, was, I mean, it was like everything was 100% from his attire to his way of talking to, to the work. It was totally consistent. And so, I, I mean, I knew that, you know, it, that's what I'm still shooting for. You know, if I can make something that, makes other people, and I'm always very flattered when other artists say, yeah, I get it, I get that feeling, or I know, you know, what you're shooting for. But it took a long time for me to accept that. But I still always say, how come, how come more people can feel it in music than in art? It, it, it shouldn't be that. I mean, they should be able to, I don't consciously say, I'm gonna make them feel that whether they like it or not. You know, but, but if you do that's really good man yeah i think your success rate with transferring that feeling is pretty high for me at least oh, so well thank you thank does you. your associate your partner here have a, any questions no i'm i'm, I'm just uh I'm hanging out in the corner okay great You're giving a rhythm section yeah <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that um, lovely question. Uh, our next question is from Benjamin Keating, although I don't know if he's available to speak now and I can move to it a different question if, if not. Hi. Is it live? Yes. <laughs> Ron, I had a question about your inside outside. And I was just wondering if it was related to what Pete always used to say about letting the dark out. And um, I guess something that you said, which was a little bit more interesting than Pete's kind of let the dark out was that to let the, that wasn't a vessel, but to let the inside out, which makes it a vessel in some other people's eyes. And I was just wondering if you, Say more about letting the inside out and if it does relate to um, what Pete used to say, which was to let the dark out. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I know everybody that's answering your question is a very interesting question, but I'm, I'm, I am <laughs> interested. Is that we, have, we, we forget in, in good, some good ways that contemporary ceramics or ceramics in general usually started off with the vessel. And the thing that's peculiar is that you can make something, particularly a totally almost closed object that looks solid, but in reality, particularly if you get to pick it up, uh, is, is hollow. So you get this fragileness, if you will, and contradiction of what it looks like it might feel like and what it is. And I never thought that that would transfer through to the work I'm doing now. But in, in reality, I think it does. There is this inside outside thing that I think that I'm abandoning, but really not. I mean, that was one reason why, you know, I put holes in the top of things forever. And eventually these things evolved into, you know, sculpture, uh, that didn't have that, but does have an inside outside. Um, not all of them I have that, but many of them do. Um, so thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. And thanks, Ron. 
Um, our final question, or our penultimate question actually, will come from our very own Cal McKeever. Thank you, Anya. This has been really great. Thank you, Dan, again. This is a, a wonderful conversation. Last okay. week, last week, Ron, you sent over the image, the promotional image for us to put on our Instagram, and you were wearing this great red lobster shirt. I couldn't, I, I love the shirt. I love the shirt. And here you log in today and you have a boy <laughs> poster behind you and you're wearing I forgot about red that. glasses. I and I, <laughs> I just have to ask, is there, is there a genesis of the, the, the lobster fixation? Is there? <laughs> yeah, I, get, I, I explained a bit, a bit of it uh, a little bit earlier. And just one thing, I, I talked about a, a, a Seinfeld episode with lobster hands. And then there's this guy who is a carnival sideshow act who had hands like lobsters. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing something. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to see if my shorts are. Yes, I have them on. Can you see them? <laughs> well, I'm wearing lobster shorts today. I had no idea this was going to come up. <laughs> I've become obsessed with it. <laughs> and those around me and those uh, and my daughter and soon my granddaughter, well, they'll all become lobster fans. There's a restaurant called Red Lobster. I don't know if they have them out your way. And um, did you give me that shirt? No, I think it's a shirt. Uh, my daughter, maybe I don't know. Maybe I got her online. I don't know. Anyway, so it's a it's a favorite. But also the images, you know, just the visual imagery of lobster hands and the sectioning of how a lobster is put together. I do get a lot of stuff from nature. My favorite animal is the the, the elephant. I love elephants. I could never understand why if you were taking life drawing to learn how to draw, that it always had to be a human. I said, why don't you bring some animals in? One of my friends actually did bring in a horse one day for life drawing. <laughs> my man, Ed Burrell, as a matter of fact, lost that cup. Anyway. Uh, and if you're out there somewhere, the cosmos is calling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyhow. Right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Ron. Thank you. That's so great. I wish you could see the, the shorts. <laughs> um, oh, do I can show you. You can stand. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Get the hey, that guy's a creep. He showed me his lobster shorts. <laughs> um, Didn't Jeffrey Tubin lose his job over that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, those oh, weren't lobster shorts. Those were not lobster shorts. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for all these great questions, everyone. I wish we could get to all of them, um, but yeah, the chat has just been um, very lively and I'll definitely send that over to Ron um, after the conversation. Oh, um, great, thank you so much. Yeah, so they're really, really wonderful comments. Um, oh, and our final comment will come from um, our publisher and artistic director, Bong. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ron. What a show. Hey, Paul. Oh, wow. I, I've been long for a show of you for so long. So final is here. It's just, it's just so satisfying because this is my third time coming back. Wow. Love, love the show, Ron. I admire your work so <laughs> much. And, and I just can't wait because as much as you love lobster, I love goldfish. So I goldfish, think goldfish. Well, yeah, we need to talk about that. It's a separate yeah, goldfish, isn't there? A real corny commercial on <laughs> it says, "Don't be so coy." <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, you know, in, in yesterday, I was at MoMA looking at Cezanne's drawing the last <laughs> day with two good painter friends, uh, David Reed and Guy Goodwin, mm -hmm. and we were looking at it very carefully and David Reed pointed out that Cezanne never erased his drawing, which is interesting to me in that, thinking about Morandi, by the way, I don't know, you're friendly with Wayne Thiebaud, this is a sign, I'll get back to it. 
But Wayne, Wayne, Wayne team, I, I don't know. I met Wayne uh, a couple times, and he's a huge and extremely articulate uh, person about Morandi. He loves Morandi and also George Harriman. That's right. And he bought Morandi, he told me, in even leading to the 80, early 80s, you can still buy it for a few thousand dollars. Yes, his son had a gallery. And I yep. went and saw that show. It was the first time I think I'd ever seen that many Mirandis in one place. Yeah. And I was going, shit, man. I wish I, you know, I didn't have the money at the time. Yeah. And uh, then re recently, obviously before his death, John Baldessari says, I bought him, I just bought a Mirandi. Yeah. You won't believe how much I paid for it. And I didn't know what that meant. Lots or he got a deal. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's so anyway. it's so interesting, Ron. Because we were talking about Morandi. Uh, I was proposing after having seen the show to both Guy and David that it seems to me that why he mediate his early anxious work, which is so violent, no yeah. rape scene, murder scene. You know his admiration Dalacroix. Uh, could easily de derail his ambition as a painter until he met Pizarro, who advised him, gave him comfort, and, and encouraged him to paint from life. That's when uh -huh. it really becomes his art. But it's so interesting that David Reed pointed out that he doesn't erase. So it, immediately, I felt a, a, you know, an urgent need to point out in my own perspective, reading them, is that it seems to me that Giacometti and Morandi are two direct air disciples of Cezanne, whereas yeah. Giacometti seemed to represent the anxiety, anxious side, a lot of a razor doubting what he's seeing, where Morandi represents the serene side of Cezanne. Yes, serenity is, that's, that's a perfect way of describing uh, Morandi. And I'm a huge Giacometti fan. In fact, I went to the Morandi Museum in Bologna. Yeah. And instead, they had a uh, Giacometti show. Um, so I didn't get to see as many whatever, you know, yeah. Morandi that I would like. But I, I own about 20 books. <laughs> and, and I'm always surprised. Somebody on Instagram digs them too. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll say, oh, man, I've never seen that one before. I mean, the guy was prolific. And I think probably worked fairly quickly. Uh, yes. I, I'm particularly fond of the ones where the paint is a little bit thicker and that became a big uh, item of controversy between people who say, oh, I like the thinner paint. No, I like the thick paint. I'm a thick paint guy when it comes to Morandi, but the drawings, I, I erase constantly. And, and that uh, this encourages me hearing this from you that I'm, I might leave the erasing, uh, you know, I mean, I'll erase, but I can only erase so much and they kind of sneak through anyway, because it, it is what it is. That's what happened. The mistakes are part of the deal. Yeah. And, uh, gives, gives credence to the fact that they say somebody did this and they're not trying to tart it up for you to make it nice or anything. So, I mean, and I have drawings that I, definitely, you know, clean up or whatever, but there's other ones that I think have more spirit by mm. just doing them off the top while I'm watching television. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank Anya, you. Am I, am I to, to be the reader today? Yes, you are, yes. Okay, uh, right. yeah. so it is my privilege to end a great talk between Dan and Ron just now. And I'm reading the segment from the most recent book of our beloved poetry editor, Anson Berrigan, uh, who's in a way a conscience of the rail, what we do with the rail. Uh, we appreciate what Anson does and how he had fed us so many armies of poets to restore the dignity, the complexity, the beauty of our language every Wednesday, our radical poetry reading series. So uh, I'm just reading a, a segment uh, from Regrets. This is a book called, and um, 
to me, the, the book is just amazing. It's about duration. As much as about mind space and time seem to spiral along with the flood of images which part of his work. So here it is. Not reading properly, too slow, too fast, too loud, my eyes split, too dumb, impatient, too much known to be patient with a page claims to knowing, too polite, too tired enough, not high enough, can't see anything, can't retain process, implode, give in too much spite towards hints of judgment, too much desire for digression, explosive, diction, self, rhetoricized into passive the ideal, too much indulgence of sound, not enough projection, not enough big sloppy American projection into prosaic flat line story, not enough belief in argument, not enough machinery, not enough soft edge, not enough shame temperament on lacadaisical interpretation front too much detachment from character, not enough faith in allegory, no faith in allegory, metaphor, objectivity, integration of construct while letting another be made, too much selection, too much expansion, not enough obliteration, not too much recognition of chaos as safely, too much patient for the jam to make its cuts, not enough listening, too much too, too, too much listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Oh, wow. I, I really that. identify with that. Cool, I will send your remark just now to Ansem. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. Oh. Thank you, Dan. Thank you okay. so much. Go see the show, you guys. Thank you, Dan. As usual, it's brilliant. Thank Back you, Paul. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the show's up until October 23rd at Matthew Marks Gallery. Go check it out. Um, and uh, thank you all to those who tuned in today and for your incredible questions and your ponderings in the chat. I can't wait to go back and read it. And as always, we'll share the recording of today's program on our YouTube archives. So it'll be available in a day or two if you'd like to revisit the conversation. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Katya Santibanez and Lily Wei. And we'll conclude with another reading of Bergen's Pregrets from our own Ty Cooper. And you can now uh, go ahead and you should be able to unmute yourself and say thank you and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. So much. What an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Always the cheese. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Anya. Thank you so much. It's a great way to start out our week.